So I'd like to open this up to discussion. Are there any questions? Hi, uh, I know that your comments about measurement um, are something you probably fo follow more to the spirit than to the letter, but um, what would be your response to claims that um, measurement in types of projects such as these um, increases efficiency? Like, if you know that, you know, one type of model is more effective than the other, then, you know, you can divert more resources towards that, for example. Mm -hmm. um, I, I couldn't in any way deny that that's true. I mean, that's certainly if you measure something and it's, it's it's like a running race where everybody is just a little bit ahead of each other. And so I'm not arguing against measurement in that case. What I'm arguing against is the kind of projects you do should be so big and the results should be so big and your visions for those results should be so big. And I see so many people in this world, particularly the measurement prone people, doing these kind of things that aren't that, and then they spend all their energy measuring it. And it just seems to me that it's, it's, it's not to say you shouldn't measure at all or so on and so forth, but the spirit of it is just missing the big changes. And uh, it's, it's, it's the benefactors, the grant organizations all push it. And it's, I just think, wrong. And it's um, going back to um, what you'd said earlier about preferring publicness. I just wondered, you know, where is anonymous speech in this and the value of anonymous speech in a free society, the value of anonymous sources for journalists? Because it seems to me that there's, there is a great value in publicness and in, and in uh, information being available to everybody. But at the same time, there's also a place for privacy in a democracy. And I wonder if you could speak to that. Gee, I'd love to defer to somebody who will speak much better to it. That's just, I, I, I'm, I'm not a student <laughs> of anonymous speech, one way or the other. I feel I benefit from it. I feel sometimes I see people wickedly hurt by it. But it's, I'm sure, like Jeff Jarvis, I would rather hear from Jeff on it than... <laughs> <laughs> Anonymity is a is part and parcel of free speech. You know, the, the the ability to speak in any form and to and have that action is absolutely vital to protect. Privacy is vital to protect. Anonymity is vital to protect, and it's related to privacy. Um, my only point is that there's also obviously benefit to publicness, and we talk too much about what bad could happen. Uh, and in anonymity, I think it's getting too much of a bad reputation now because of trolls. Right, that people are, are 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 saying nasty things, and if they just stood up behind their their, their names, everything would be okay. Um, and I used to make fun of that. I don't so much anymore. I think one of the insights of Facebook is that real identity and real relationships add value to this. But in any of that, anonymity has an important role in a democracy for um, sources and whistleblowers and uh, people without privilege who fear being able to speak and being able to connect with other people as a result of anonymity. So it, needs to be, it must be protected. Thank you. Hi, um, this is not directed at anyone in particular, but um, I was thinking about uh, Lisa Nakamura's book, Cybertypes, um, where she talks about how the, I don't know if anyone's familiar, it's pretty old, but, um, the idea that ideas of uh, race and religion and sort of social norms are translated into an online community. And so even for people, um, how, how do I phrase this in the best way? I think that when we're talking about privacy and we're talking about privilege and we're talking about publicness, we're talking about it very much from an ivory tower um, without a realization that there are things that are inscribed in, for example, language. and the ways in which we communicate and academic language versus vernaculars that, um, that can really alter how people perform themselves in the online spaces. And I think that's worth um, thinking about and discussing that there are processes of education and of um, 
imbuing knowledge that don't allow for these to be the kind of free democratic spaces that I think they were possibly envisioned to be. And so when you idealize the public space um, as a place where everyone can be safe to share their opinions um, equally without fear of imprisonment, murder, or defamation, um, that feels really, really far away for me. Could I ask Nicholas a question? It goes to this measurement mm -hmm. idea and this extraordinary description of a whole country with kids with these laptops and your expectation that something really big will result. When, when will we see it? What will it be? How will we measure? How will we perceive it? Well, <clears throat> first of all, it's already visible. And you can see in the country, and I urge anybody who's close to Uruguay to go to Uruguay, because I, I have a friend, some of you may know he's here periodically to teach, Antonio Batra, who went to uh, Uruguay recently and went to a very poor village on the coast and went into somebody's hut. And the woman had seven children, and five of them had laptops, and they were running their little network at home. And uh, this was a really poor house. And the mother said just completely that and next year, the sixth one will be five years old, and we'll have six laptops at home. Those kids are growing up so differently. They all have internet addresses, email addresses at school, Wi-Fi at school, and often Wi-Fi at home. Um, their, their curiosity, the way they approach problems, the way they look at things from, from different ways. They, yes, they play games, but they own the laptop. So they use it not just a few hours at school. They use it for movies. They use it for all sorts of things. So I think you're going to see a nation in about 10 years, 15 years, is, is the real time when it counts, that is going to be far more creative than many other nations. It's going to be, it's, Uruguay could be the first truly creative nation because kids grew up this way. In between the sorts of things that you might measure, um, which, which are being measured, and they measure a lot down there, and you can go to their websites, and if you can read Spanish, you'll find a lot more than I can. But the, the sort of things they look at is how many kids don't go from, you know, fail the grade they're in and have to stay back a grade. It used to be a relatively significant number. It's almost disappeared. Um, you, so you get results like that that are pretty interesting measurements and, uh, you know, make them. But I think that the boldness of doing it was, is, is, is what's going to change the country and we're going to see things, you know, results that are really quite astonishing. I'll tell you a quick Uruguay story. Um, when uh, Tabare Vasquez, is named the president, announced that he was going to do every child, there was a teacher who had taught for 30 years uh, in primary school who heard this and said, I've been teaching for 30 years. I'm not going to start teaching with a laptop. And so she went to the Social Security office and she asked for early retirement. And they said, you know, come back in 10 days, and you know, it takes 10 days to process it. And in the intervening time, the laptop arrived in her classroom. And within two days, she saw the energy of her classroom change. She saw the kids change. She went right back to the Social Security office and said, change that. I want late retirement. And what happened in her class shortly thereafter, she had assigned a project to do cow, something on cows. This little girl goes home. A little disappointed she hadn't gotten a leg up on the project. And her father said, you know, you're really lucky because tonight our cow is giving birth. And our laptop has a little video camera on it. And so she went and stayed up and filmed the birth of the cow as her project and brought it to school the next day. And of course, it was by far the best project. And the kids collectively figured out how to upload it to YouTube which they did, and if you type Vaca Uruguay or something, it'll come up. And it got 100,000 hits. That the teacher said, come on, I never thought my silly homework problem would have 100,000 hits. And again, the self-esteem of the child and all of that. I think those are the things that are the big results. 
and you get a nation that grows up with kids with that kind of self-esteem and that kind of ease and you look at it and see something from multiple points of view and I don't know the answer, I go, fine, let's work on it together, be more collaborative. I mean, you're going to have very few defectors <laughs> in, a, in Uruguay. Could I ask um, what, what programs are actually on your computers and what are the kids doing with these computers when they get them? How do they know how to use them? And what do you mean, how do they know how to use them? Uh, it's, it's, it's genetic. Um, <laughs> there's, uh, in fact, we're running experiment, we're going to run a real experiment very scientifically soon where we drop these things out of helicopters into villages that have no schools and see if kids can read after a year. But every kid knows how to open up a laptop and start using it. So using a laptop is really quite simple. What they do with it actually is relatively country specific by chance. The, the Uruguayan children tend to use it to surf the web and for entertainment and other stuff. The kids in Ethiopia tend to write computer programs more and the kids in Peru do a lot of book reading. But and all of them are connected to the web? In, in, in our case, I would say of the three million, um, 2.2 2 million are connected, 2.5. It's, it's, it's hard. Audience yeah. member is trying to. Yes, somebody's. So Yes. I, I have a quick question for Martin, I believe, but yeah. also for Nick as well. So it seems to me these are like two great approaches we've heard. One is uh, build a great uh, tool, uh, of course, with a big vision in mm -hmm. mind, uh, the One Laptop Per Child initiative, uh, and see what happens, right? And experiment with it and, you know, uh, make investments and so forth. Uh, the other approach is actually to study in a very scientific way uh, human behavior, uh, at the case of uh, cooperation as an example. Um, and at the end of your talk, you, you alluded to the possibility of incorporating some of the learnings uh, into the design of institutions. Now, the question is, in a way, uh, that results at least for me from this exchange, can we bring the two things together and actually improve? So have the power, the vision, uh, the big ideas on the one hand side, and really also the force to, to implement mm -hmm. uh, while being still uh, not measuring but being smart and strategic about it uh, based on some of the insights that you were talking about or and how difficult is this translation actually from findings in science about human behavior uh, and then you know adopting these findings in the design of initiatives uh, institutions and strategies yeah, that's a hard question um, for me to answer because like listening to your talk, I find it completely amazing that you sort of do something out there. And I'm sitting uh -huh. here asking myself, what do I do out there? You know, so I'm, I'm fascinated by understanding mathematics. For me, I want to understand the mathematics of evolution and I do apply it to, to questions say like human cancer, like virus infections. So we studied the evolution of these processes. We studied the evolution of HIV treatment in, the, in 1995. So our mathematic analysis led the medical community very quickly to adopt multiple drug therapy. And now we are doing similar studies for, for uh, uh, targeted cancer therapy. But in the specific question, maybe in the specific field of cooperation, I think that we, we would like to bring the mathematical models closer together with experimental observations. So we also, we not only conduct experiments here in the Boston area, in the, in the Harvard Business School, but we sometimes go also to other countries. And then we look at differences. So for example, in our field, many people like punishment, and I'm very skeptical about punishment. I don't think punishment is a good way to actually get cooperation because it leads to many other problems. So we study reward, and reward works extremely well here in Boston, for example, where people play a public goods game, and then afterwards they have the option of private interactions, and so they reward those who contributed to the public good. And they do not have a positive cooperation with somebody who withholds cooperation in the public good game, so it works well. Then we go to Romania, and we did the same experiment there, and the outcome was fascinating. People gave up on the public good, but only cooperated in private. They kind of didn't link the two games. And the people there said to us, this makes complete sense because people distrust that a public situation will ever lead to a productive outcome, but know that in my private interactions I can count on productive outcomes. And so we could then ask the question, how can we use such insights to help society to lead 
confidence in public projects, but that's not my. Okay, um, yes. Oh, I was, uh, my question goes to uh, both Charlie and to Negropani. Um, I absolutely agree with you that the thing that I hate about privacy is it's always been a sort of afterthought. Um, and it's, 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 been, it's something that's been in the way of things and we use uh, the legacy environments that we have are always trying to ease the tension so that something else can happen. Um, but, and then when I fast forward to the one lap per child, you know, I'm, I'm kind of amazed because the different, one of the huge differences in the question of privacy. In an agricultural society, the question of privacy isn't normally individual privacy, it's usually group privacy, my family, my culture. Because in fact, the group has to, so, they're so dependent on each other for survival that there can't be privacy. Privacy often gets in the way of, of the trust that they need. And so in agricultural societies, there's this idea of group privacy. But eventually, in the same kind of afterthought, one lap per child is gonna hit privacy barriers around the group. Because as these children link to each other, are sharing information across, they're breaking a kind of natural cultural boundary. And they're taking that culture into a different space. And, and one question will be, I wonder what the privacy clashes will be, what the harms will look like, and what the space of remedies will be. Because they're likely not they may or may not be the same as ours. And I was wondering if you had had any insight in that. I'm not sure we've had enough experience to have a really deep insight. Uh, what we have done, though, is we've taken privacy of the child very seriously. And both in the hardware, so for example, you can't remotely <laughs> tap into the camera uh, and you can't remotely record uh, without the child knowing. There's real circuits in there for that. And you can also elect, and this is the government elects the security, uh, where if the laptop is stolen, you can disable it and turn it into a brick, and you, the child can report it as stolen, and that machine is taken out of service remotely, so the child isn't blamed for something that they, they didn't do. Um, so again, these are technical things that people have thought about and embedded in it, but time is going to tell more. I'm not sure it's so much privacy as the, 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 the cultural differences uh, that, that exist today that, that will not exist tomorrow. And that's, that's a much longer term issue. Sorry. Uh, I, I really enjoyed the cooperation talk because I think the web, sort of the spread of the internet, has allowed this side of human behavior to be a lot more visible, which I think has really helped break the hegemony of the utility function maximizing individual I've never met. And uh, I mean, according to those theories, Wikipedia is not possible, all sorts of things are not possible. So I'm really curious about how this kind of um, development of the kind of work you guys are doing in evolutionary biology and sort of human society and analysis is informed by this new visibility of a very basic human fact, this kind of we are cooperative social animals. I like to say we're somewhere between ants and dogs. We don't like to admit it, but that's where we are. So how does that interact with what you observe, what kind of data you use, and does it influence your thinking about this? So, so we, would, we, we, we like to compare the human behavior with animal behavior. So we ask um, what kind of cooperation do we see in the animal world and how does this um, uh, agree or in what sense is human cooperation different? And of these five mechanisms that I mentioned there, all can actually be used by animals to a certain extent and some actually by animals to a much greater extent. But the one that we have in an unlimited way is the indirect reciprocity because it ties in with human language. And the indirect reciprocity that we see in the animal world must rely on direct observation because we do not really have any examples where animals could communicate this information of their own experience. So what humans can do is they don't rely on their own personal experience with someone in order to make a decision whether or not it is possible to cooperate with this person or not. I think the web can help us a lot to distribute this information about people and about companies and institutions rapidly. 
and to evaluate the actions and to criticize the actions and then these people have the feeling we are being watched and we have to be careful regarding our reputation. perspectives depending on how you look at it, the way that the pictures of the laptops have different perspectives depending on how you look at it. So we started out with the assumption that cooperation is often something, well, who is against cooperation? <laughs> but on the other hand, one of the things to keep in mind is that with all the talk we have of privacy, the cooperation that exists in these models is perhaps in many ways indistinguishable from coercion. So, you know, it's a very interesting piece to look at because what we have with the web is this infinite reputation, a permanent history where everyone knows everything you've done in every place. It will certainly make you cooperate with the norms of the society. So one of the things we're left with is this question of, is cooperation a good thing? Thank you. Thank you.